In my previous video, I covered some basic concepts and definitions concerning the use of cryptography as it relates to IoT devices. Before diving further into how this applies to IoT devices, I want to spend a little time discussing digital signatures themselves. Before we even get into digital signatures, let's take a few minutes and think about where the term comes from, signatures. In this instance, Alice is signing her name on a contract. And what this signature means is something along the lines of her indicating that she agrees with the document. Other times, the signer of a document is indicating their approval for what is described in the document. Think of somebody writing a check. The meaning of the signature has a lot to do with the contents of the document itself, with the signature being a kind of testament that the person signing it approves of or agrees with the document. Unfortunately, paper signatures aren't very robust. It isn't that difficult of a skill to learn to forge someone's signature. Their signature is also not really related to the document contents. The document can be modified. The signature stays the same. From this, we can see two important principles that digital signatures will need to have. First, they need to be difficult to forge. And second, they need to be based on the contents of the document being signed. Of these two requirements, let's address the second one first. In cryptography, we have something known as a hash function. Two important properties of these hash functions are they take an arbitrary sized document as input, and with that input, they produce a fixed sized output. Often the size of the output is right in the name of the hash function. For example, SHA-256 outputs 256 bits. So these properties allow us to build our digital signature off of something fixed in size. In order for the hash function to be useful to us, it needs a few more properties, though. One, it must be difficult to forge. If I'm given the output of a hash function, it should not be feasible for me to come up with a document that generated that hash. To see why this is so important, even though our whole document will be visible, we have to consider the compression aspect, the large input, fixed output. The nature of this compression means that there will also be multiple documents that can produce the same output. If it's easy to come up with a document that generates a given hash, it would be easy to come up with a second document that produced the same hash. This aspect of collision avoidance is also a requirement of itself. The details aren't that important now, but there are cryptographic attacks on hash functions that often find generating two documents that have the same hash. The older MD5 hash function is no longer used because algorithms have been found that can quickly modify a second document so that its hash matches the first document. This would be the equivalent of modifying the document that somebody placed a physical signature on. A common hash function these days is SHA-256. Some of the older functions such as SHA-1 and MD5 are now considered weak and shouldn't be used in new designs. Hash functions are one part making digital signatures. The other is what is known as a digital signature algorithm. Digital signatures use something known as asymmetric keys. Now, asymmetric keys are used for both signing as well as encryption, but we'll just be looking at the signing. We begin by generating what is known as a key pair. The key generator takes pseudo-random numbers from a source of entropy and produces two keys. The structure and the format of the keys depends on the algorithm, which we'll get to after we go over the process in general. One of these will be referred to as a private key, and the other as a public key. The names are descriptive. The private key is something that the owner of the key needs to keep private. For example, on a device, it should be protected from being read out. And the public key is just that. It can be known by anyone. With these two parts of the key, we can make a digital signature. The digital signature algorithm takes the private key and the hash of the message that we described earlier and produces a signature. The signature is also a small message. 
The other important part of a digital signature scheme is to verify that it is correct. The verify operation takes the digital signature generated before, the public key, and the digest of the message, and tells us simply if the signature is correct or not. If any part of this were tampered with, the signature check would fail. For example, if the message were tampered with, the recipient would get a different hash, and the signature check would fail. What I haven't explained is how the recipient knows that the public key is the right one. An attacker might be able to change the message, but also substitute a different public key. Ensuring that the right public key is used will be the topic of the fourth video in this series. For now, let's just assume we have a way to ensure this public key is correct. Until now, I've shown the aspect of the algorithms abstractly. There are several commonly used digital signature algorithms, and each has some details and even caveats that are important to know. Now, the oldest, commonly used digital signature algorithm is based on RSA. RSA, which are the initials of its inventors, Rivis, Shamir, and Edelman, is a relatively simple algorithm, but it's important to be careful when using it. An RSA private key, explained simply, is just two large prime numbers. For 2048-bit RSA, a commonly used size, these values, typically called P and Q, would be 1024-bit prime numbers. Their product is the 2048-bit public key. Choosing the two prime numbers has to be done carefully, or the keys are vulnerable. And if the same prime number is ever used to generate two different public keys, all of the public keys based on that can be easily computed. It's important to use established and well-tested implementations, and it's crucial to have a good random number generator to avoid these problems. Although RSA is able to sign small messages, meaning it would be possible to directly use RSA to sign the hash, there are numerous weaknesses with this approach. Instead, a scheme known as RSA PSS, RSA Probabilistic Signature Scheme, is used. There is an older signature scheme, usually just called version 1.5, that although it's still used, shouldn't be designed into anything new. To summarize RSA PSS, the keys are difficult to make, requiring quite a bit of CPU time, and care needs to be taken. Also, the keys in the signatures are fairly large. For RSA 2048, a public key may be about 300 bytes, whereas the private key can be much larger, perhaps 1200 bytes. Signatures will be 256 bytes. RSA has the advantage of being fairly fast. Another commonly used digital signature algorithm is ECDSA. ECDSA is based on elliptic curve cryptography known as ECC, which I'm not going to try to explain in this video. The algorithm tends to be more complex than RSA, as well as slower. However, there are some distinct advantages over RSA. First, both keys and signatures in elliptic curves are much smaller, typically an eighth or a quarter the size of an RSA key with similar security. It's also much easier to generate private keys. Typically, this is done by selecting some number of random bits and performing a simple sanity test. Rather than most random choices being rejected, like RSA, most of the choices end up being fine as a key. One bit of complexity with ECDSA and elliptic curves in general is that it is necessary to choose the curve to use. The choice of the curve has a lot of impact on the security of the algorithms using it, and there are a lot of choices. NIST publishes a set of recommended curves, and a common choice is to use one known as NIST P256, or also SEC P256R1. Like RSA, there are some caveats when using ECDSA. The signing algorithm itself requires some random bits to produce a number known as K. If the same value of K is ever used to sign two different messages, the private key can be calculated. It's therefore crucial that any application that generates signatures, meaning any part of the communication that possesses a private key, have a good, unpredictable source of random numbers. I'd also like to speak of another specific variant of digital signatures using elliptic curves, a signature algorithm known as ED25519. 
This is a signature algorithm like ECDSA, but also defines other aspects of the system as well. It is specified for a single elliptic curve, known as curve 25519. This curve was designed to be easier to implement correctly and in a way that doesn't have side channels. Because the curve is specified and was chosen to be easy to implement, the implementations tend to be faster than ECDSA for other curves. There are even implementations that are faster than RSA, although these tend to require a lot of code space for pre-computed tables. One thing about ECDSA that's different from the other signature algorithms is that it takes the entire message rather than just the hash of the message. It still ends up doing the operation on a hash of the message, but it prefixes the message with some secret data to reduce the likelihood of certain attacks on the hash function being able to weaken signatures made using that hash. It's still possible to give the signature scheme a hash of the message, but this advantage will then be given up. Given these choices then, how do we choose which digital signature scheme we should use for an application? There are several things to consider, such as code size and performance. There are also considerations of long-term security and how the algorithms might be resistant to future advances in quantum computing. This overview of digital signatures has shown how digital signatures can be used, like a physical signature, to convey some type of assurance to a particular message. In the next video, we will look into the practical aspects of how digital signatures are used within IoT devices.